Good evening. Um, my name is Robert Dijkraaf, I'm director of the Institute for Advanced Study, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here. And this pleasure is really particularly true for the guest of honor, Mark Potwell. And to other guests of honors, trustee uh, Brian Rubel and his uh, lovely wife Kathleen. Um, and I think actually the true guest of honor is the wonderful art that's outside. And I think this is a very special evening because we will be talking about art. And, um, and uh, one of the amazing thing I think of the Institute of Advanced Studies, if we all think of a center of scholarship, uh, one of the great facts of its history that I like very much, and it's wonderful to see, Irving and Marilyn here, because you wrote about this, that when the first director started the institute, you might think, well, he starts with a, a budget or a building or with complicated plans. But the first thing he did was uh, to uh, design, have a seal designed. So it started with art from the very beginning. It was, uh, and, and the motto, uh, truth and beauty, which actually I think uh, is something that you know, we can all relate to. Um, I think it's also perennial complaint that there is not, not enough art here at the Institute. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly something that brings people together. And the fact that we are here to uh, celebrate the, the lovely and generous donation of, of, of Brian and Kathleen of the, of the prints to the Institute, uh, it's, I think it's good to remember, and particularly for you, for you, Mark, that you might think, well, they're hanging here in the dining hall. You know, couldn't you think of a more appropriate place to do so? And, uh, but you should understand that life at the Institute has a very special rhythm. You know, uh, we wake up in the morning, some of us earlier than others, and, uh, and so there's kind of, a, kind of a cloud that kind of under the force of gravity contracts around lunch, and then we all fit in here. And actually that also sets the size of this institution, that we can all fit in the dining hall. And then we have very spirited conversations at lunch, and, uh, and then it's... There's a divergent phase where people again, you know, go to the offices to do collaboration. So I think it, it is a focus of institute life, and actually to have the art here uh, is really at the heart of the institute. So I think it's uh, it, it's very appropriate. Um, it's it's also kind of great for us because one thing of my own experience here that you know there's a lot of learned uh, essays and pieces about the relation between art and science and scholarship. Uh, but clearly, I think, you know, the most interesting of that connection is the, uh, I would say, kind of the explorative uh, component. The fact that, you know, both artists and scientists and scholars are searching and do this. And uh, as we hear in a moment, you even combine all these qualities in, in one mind, which is, is, is absolutely exceptional. I think also at this collection, uh, and the theme of the collection is very appropriate. It's here at the Institute. Now, the Institute played, a, I would say, a, a role in world history that is many orders of magnitude larger than it was originally thought of. And I think that has been a recurrent theme here. But um, we are very much aware every moment of, uh, of the day that the original principles on which the Institute was founded, which is in, in, in terms of the original language, open for everyone, irregardless of sex, race, and religion. To put that in the 1930s actually was a very powerful statement. And actually, world history somehow uh, amplified that role. And so I feel the Institute, in some sense, is, uh, well, and, and still is, in many ways, a, uh, a lens to look through the world, to look at world history, and, um, and also, at the same time, be reflective, but also uplifting. And um, I don't think there's a better way to capture all of this than art. And Mark uh, has done a tremendous job in, in, in putting his art to work in this, in this fashion. The, uh, the collection um, was first exhibited at the Terrazin Ghetto Museum near Prague in the spring of 2014. It contains 52 archival pigment prints of drawings and acrylic paintings and uh, 23 of them are now uh, on display. And as you will have read and seen, these prints illustrate the tragedies and injustices suffered by the Jewish people. Uh, given that Jews have long been known as the people of the book, each print resembles a book's page. Uh, these illustrations are all paired with biblical verses, all from the Psalms, and it said, where it said, whatever is written in the book of Psalms is timeless. 
So uh, I think uh, in many ways it's most appropriate and I think you know, really uh, thanks to, to you Brian and Kathleen for making this possible that this wonderful collection is here at the Institute. Uh, Mark you were describing how it's at the uh, libraries of many famous institutions of higher learning. One of our trustees like to call us the University of Universities, so <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's uh, I would say even more appropriate that this collection is here. Um, we are actually uh, very honored and, uh, and touched by the fact that this institution uh, can be host to your wonderful work. Um, but now, of course, uh, this really begs the question, tell us more about the artist, Mark Portal. And there's no better person, I think, to do so then uh, Brian, Brian Rubel, who is the Chairman Emeritus of the Jackson Laboratory. He has been a dedicated Institute trustee since his appointment in 1992. Uh, Brian, you have been active in all, all the working parts of the Institute, I would say, and you're a great help to, to, to me and to the staff. Um, so we are very thankful in general for your knowledge and guidance. But I think in particular, we are thankful to your knowledge and guidance in uh, W bringing this wonderful gift to us. So please uh, welcome Brian Rubel. Thank you. I, I should, before I start, I should point out that, uh, that Robert is also a rather accomplished artist uh, in his own right, and we a number of us have seen uh, something that he did recently that's quite wonderful in, in honor of uh, Freeman Dyson, who's here someplace also. Um, and, uh, uh, and all of this, and also a mathematical physicist of some <laughs> repute. I'm, uh, I'm kind of stunned by the, uh, uh, surrounded by Renaissance people here, and, and you, Mark, are obviously one of them. Um, I'd like to welcome Mark and his wife, Ayala. Where's Ayala? There you are, okay. It was very nice to meet you for the first time. I've known Mark for a really long time. I, I have some prepared biographical remarks, but I'll get to them in a minute. I've known Mark for a really long time because he's, he's actually, he's my, one of my, my physicians. He's, he's my dermatologist. In fact, is this, is this the first time you've seen me with, with my clothes on? This is, uh, I just wanted to, you know, check, is there a shock here? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, I'm really very pleased you were able to come and, and speak today, really. I'm, I'm now going to, just for some background, I, I'm going to read something. I hope to, to do justice to it. Mark Paul Podwell may have been best known initially for his drawings in the New York Times or on the New York Times op-ed page. And that's when I first discovered, before his office began to be turned into kind of the Mark Podwell Museum, this wonderful art in his office. You don't want to go in for the examination because you can't get out of the reception area uh, without feeling some sense of loss. But um, in addition, he's the author and illustrator of numerous books. Most of these works, Podwell's own, as well as those he has illustrated for others, including Ilu Wiesel and Harold Bloom, typically focus on Jewish legend, history, and tradition. His art is represented in the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Israel Museum, and the Library of Congress. Beyond the works on paper, Mark's artistry has been employed in an array of diverse projects, including a series of decorative plates for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a congressional gold medal, and embroidered textiles for Prague's 700-year-old synagogue. The Alt Neuschel, Alt Neuschel. Kathleen was coaching me on pronouncing that, pronouncing that, and I blew it. Um, the Metropolitan Opera has commissioned Podwell to create a new limited edition print for each opera season. The most recent print for Don Giovanni, and I have two of them over there, which I'm giving as gifts to my wife and my sister on big round birthdays that I won't talk about. And Mark has kindly signed them for both of them. My sister is a physician in New York, and she is the one who found all my doctors, <laughs> including Mark, and called me one day and said, look at the New York Times. It's Dr. Podwall's drawing. So I, I'm, I'm quite grateful to her. In 1996, the French government named Mark Podwall an officer of the Order of Arts and Letters, and in 2011, he received the Jewish Cultural Achievement Award from the Foundation for Jewish Culture. In 2012, his Aquitant was the print of the month at the V&A Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. At the Theresen Ghetto Museum in 2014, there was an exhibition of Podwell's 42 new paintings and drawings, these that you see out here, which are disturbing reminders of how Europe's extensive history of Jew hatred laid the groundwork for the Holocaust. 
All 42 original artworks exhibited at Theresen have been published as archival pigment prints, each set housed in a custom-made archival case. These portfolios have been acquired by Hebrew University, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, Library of Congress, Princeton University, Harvard University, Yale University, Columbia University, the National Library of Israel, and of course the Institute for Advanced Study now, among many, many others. Thank you very much, Mark. It's all right. Well, thank you very much. This is a great honor to have my work here, to be invited here. Thank you very, very much, Brian and Kathleen. Thank you very much, Robert. Also, Chris Ferreira. We emailed almost every day for the last month about, about this event. Um, the film that you're about to see is a 39-minute film from Czech television. It'll first be broadcast on Czech TV at the end of January, which is when Holocaust Day is memorialized in, uh, in Europe. The, the reason for this film was Czech television initially had done a film on the textiles I had designed for the 700-year-old synagogue in Prague. And th there was such a great response to that film that when Czech TV heard that I was doing this series, they asked if they could do a film documenting the, uh, what was happening with this series. So Czech TV came to New York and interviewed Elie Wiesel and Peter Gelb from the Met Opera. They took me to where I grew up in Queens. They filmed me at Auschwitz and Krakow and Terezin and Prague. And uh, 14 days of filming uh, became a 39-minute film. There was much also that couldn't be included in the final version, including scenes in Polna, which was the site of the 1899 blood libel. But um, the way they edited the film is really terrific. There was original musical written for this film. And uh, the very famous American artist Leonard Baskin once wrote, artists should be seen, not heard. So I'm not saying anything else. The humiliations, persecutions, and massacres of Jews by Nazi Germany, to a great extent, all had their precedence in the Middle Ages. Ghettos, distinctive clothing, slaughters, exiles, were suffered time and again by Jews in Europe. Overshadowed by the Holocaust, these earliest sufferings, the magnitude of these early sufferings, tend to be forgotten. This is the hidden synagogue in the Terezin ghetto, and on the wall there's a prayer from the morning service. Nor al tishkocheno. Yet, despite all this, we have not forgotten your name. This is the theme of my exhibition at Terezin. The 42 artworks depict the history of the Jewish people, their suffering and their misfortunes, which occurred throughout the centuries. Each artwork is depicted as a page from a book, and so each drawing and painting is accompanied by a verse from the Book of Psalms describing the artwork. For an artist, each work is often instilled with doubt. According to the American artist Ben Sean, there are no guideposts, maps, or geography to tell the artist that he or she is on the right path. When Rabbi Pates first proposed to Terezin that they give me an exhibition, and I was then told that the idea was accepted, in thinking about what to draw, I thought that the road to Terezin would be the right path for this exhibition. It occurred to me that once Mark had done uh, an exhibition in, uh, at the Jewish Museum in Prague, it would be appropriate for him uh, to have some of his works shown at the exhibition space in the uh, Ghetto Museum in Terezin. It never occurred to me that he would uh, create a whole new series uh, of drawings. I figured he would just take some of his Prague drawings, which are so magnificent, and some of the color uh, uh, washes that he's done, and uh, send them for the exhibition. But no, that's not Mark. He took on a whole new uh, assignment to look at the, the series of uh, tragedies that have uh, dotted Jewish life over these last uh, uh, two uh, millennia. Clearly, Jewish history is not a history only of sad events. 
but there have been plenty of sad events. And in spite of it all, we're still here, and we're still productive, and we're still the Jewish people. For the first 21 years of my life, my life revolved around this area. This is the apartment building I grew up in. Across the street is the public school I went to. About a kilometer away is the high school I went to. About a kilometer this way is the college I went to. But when I lived here, the neighborhood was almost entirely Jewish. I never encountered any anti-Semitism growing up. Now, as we drove here today, I noticed so much the neighborhood has changed that the synagogue where I was bar mitzvahed is now a church. For many years, I never had any of my paintings or drawings hanging in my office, and then I started to put them up. And then one day, an elderly woman was about to have a biopsy, and she was very, very nervous, and it was a biopsy on her nose. So to trying to reassure her, I said, See that drawing on the wall? I did that. I'm an artist. And the woman responded, I much prefer this biopsy be done by a doctor. It's true. I think that uh, um, because you're an artist, it makes, I think, a patient feel much more reassured that your eyes are looking at their skin as opposed to just an ordinary physician because you're looking at it with a much more sophisticated eye. So when you look at piece of skin, you're looking at it with all the subtleties of the colors and the shapes much more acutely than the average dermatologist. And I know because I've gone to a lot of dermatologists. Já jsem přišel do New Yorku a samozřejmě Amerika pro mě byla země, kde byly různý vlivy, v kterých jsem se nevyznal, tak jsem se díval po obrázcích, který by mě inspirovali a který by se mi líbily. A objevil jsem v New York Times obrázky, které byly podepsané Mark Podwal. A to jméno mě přišlo český, ale taky se mi líbily ty obrázky. Krásná linka, takže jsem je obdivoval. Mark is really an amazing, special person. He has, as I said before, insights that I think other people don't seem to have. He looks at something and sees more than is there and brings into what is there information and understanding and insight that helps to expand the piece that he is drawing. He pictures thoughts and ideas that others have described in words and which certainly can be subject to a lot of different uh, uh, graphic applications. But when he does it, for example, the drawing of the Altnoy Shul with the letters of the, of the prayers streaming out into, into the open air, it, it's just, it's so, it's thrilling to see. Well, Mark and I have been friends for so many years, so many years, so many years. We have done so many things together. Uh, it's almost impossible today for me to speak about Mark just like that. He's, a friend, an old friend, and uh, I followed him from the very beginning. And he, he began actually, he began doing his, uh, his art. Uh, it was the beginning of our friendship. And then he developed, and then today he is very, very good. I don't even remember what, I don't, I don't count. I'm not good at counting. <laughs> I know there were many, but anyway, there were good books. I remember the Haggadah that we did, absolutely, the Golem that we did together. Just things like that. They are good. Since 1999, my work has been in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. And twice, one of my paintings was the art object of the day on the Met's website. When the Met first reproduced one of my paintings as a decorative plate, I was so honored and excited that I didn't ask for a royalty. When I learned that it was a bestseller, I asked if I could get a royalty on the Seda plate. And the Met said to me, you know, we're not used to dealing with living artists. I love Mozart, and I love to draw and paint to Mozart. When Peter Gelb became general manager of the Metropolitan Opera, he told me that he wanted to involve visual artists with the Met Opera, as was done years before. 
when Chagall did a poster for the Met Opera, when Richard Linder did a poster for the Met Opera. So initially, for the Met Opera, I did a poster for Nabucco. And Nabucco tells the story of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem. Mark has made uh, three different images so far for the Met. But uh, I don't keep count because I'm hoping he will make many more. So uh, you know, we hope that, uh, uh, that Mark's uh, art will continue to provide this kind of bridge between the art world and, uh, and operas that are being performed on our stage. This year, for example, this season, we have a, a revival of, a, of Mozart's uh, enduring classic, uh, Cosi Van Tutte, and that is the latest uh, uh, opera that Mark has immortalized with his, with his imagery. My family is in New York. My medical practice is in New York. The Met Museum and Met Operas that I work with are in New York. My publishers are in New York. The university that I teach in is in New York. But my synagogue is in Prague. S panem Podvalem se známe leta. První kontakt byl ve Stajonové synagoze, kam docházel za svých pražských návštěv. Když se tam udělal vícekrát, tak Samozřejmě místní lidi zajímalo, kdo je ten pán, který se čas od času objeví. A vyšlo na jeho, že je to New Yorkský lékař, ale také malíř Mark Podval. Pamatuji se na jeho živý zájem o židovské dějiny. A teprve vlastně postupně se ukázalo, že je vynikající malíř, kreslíř kterého jsem vlastně znal z některých jeho ilustrací anglicky psaných. Což pro mě byla velká radost, že jsme se mohli setkat osobně, protože já ho považuji za jaksi, výjimečného posla řekl bych, židovské kultury. On je schopen předat poselství židovské tradice způsobem, který je podle mého názoru blízký i lidem, kteří nábožensky sami o sobě třeba necítí a nebo kterým ta židovská tradice není známá. This is a sample of one of the first studies for the Torah curtain for the Altnoy Shul. Mike udělal parochet, oponu pro starou synagogu. A to je věc neobyčejně náročná, jak po té technicko-výtvarné stránce, tak i po stránce finanční. A i tam se vlastně ukázal jako neobyčejně velkojsi a schopný člověk zároveň, protože především ve Spojených státech dokázal zainteresovat donátory, kteří na tu oponu přispěli, sami navrhl, nechali ji provést. Přivezli ji a myslím mimořádnou ozdobou do naší synagogy, protože je nová a to jako se na ní pozná. Ale současně jako by tam byla vody jak živé. The dedication on this curtain, translated from the Hebrew, says, the curtain for this holy gate is a gift of the hand of my name in Hebrew, Menasha ben Michael Vedevora to the Altnoy Shul, and then it gives the Hebrew year to which it was dedicated. The Bible tells us how the children of Israel were enslaved in Egypt. And the Hebrew word for Pharaoh, Pe-Ra, means evil speech. And so here's Pharaoh and his mouth is made up of a, uh, a cobra. And the Hebrew is that his Mouth is full of the seed and lies. Mark Podval v tom svém cyklu načrtává určitou linii židovských dějin. On tam vlastně, že zajímavé, on tam třeba i do těch starověkých motivů tam vkládá narážky třeba z období nacismu. Tam je vlastně třeba propojení přímo toho svícnu sedmirameného menory, který byl po porážce povstání proti Římanům odvezen do Říma. A to je ten, je vyobrazen na Titově oblouku a Mark Podval ho zobrazuje jako nesou vlastně dva nacisté. Čili tyto vazby zde jsou a já si myslím, že on tím naznačuje, že je zde určitá násilná linie protižidovská, která provází celé židovské dějiny. On na to upozorňuje 
podle mého názoru velice decentním způsobem. Totiž jsou to narážky na jednotlivá prostě dějiná údobí. In 587 BCE, the armies of Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the first temple in Jerusalem and the Jews were exiled to Babylon. And so here's the Babylonian winged lion and a destroyed menorah and the temple in flames. After the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, among the exiles in Babylon was the prophet Ezekiel. And among his most famous prophecies was the Valley of the Dry Bones. Now this prophecy may have been interpreted by some as describing re individual resurrections, but it was really a metaphor for the restoration of the people and state of Israel. I didn't want to write out God's name, uh, which is very holy. I made the two flames of the candle having in the shape of uh, the Hebrew letter Yod spelling God's name as the flames. After the destruction of the first temple and the exile in Babylon, the Jews were permitted to return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. But after the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD by the Romans, the Jews were dispersed throughout the world. And for a thousand years, it's been reported that they lived in Prague. And for centuries, Prague became the largest and most important Jewish community in the world. Although they almost wiped me off the earth, I did not abandon your commandments. And so this represents faith and how through faith the Jewish people endured while their enemies over time vanished. And so here are the commandments, the Ten Commandments on Jewish ceremonial objects. This picture represents the Crusader massacres of the Jewish communities along the Rhine as the Crusaders marched to the Holy Land. And a chronicler at the time wrote, why did the heavens not darken when 1,100 souls were slaughtered? And so that's why there's a bright sun, Jerusalem in the distance. And the chronicle also describes the trampling of the Torahs in the streets. And the cross is made from Jerusalem and a Crusader sword. And the word blood here is painted with red. This picture is about the massacre in the Tower of York in England in 1190, when the Jews were surrounded and, and uh, sought refuge in Clifford's Tower, and Rather than be captured by the mob, 150 Jews committed suicide. In my art, I try to employ very often uh, Jewish symbols, Jewish ceremonial objects. And because the massacre takes place in a tower, I used uh, the ceremonial object of spice towers, which are used in the ceremony at the end of the uh, Sabbath to hold spices. And they're often in the shape of towers. So. This is Clifford's Tower. I made it into a spice box with these two other towers. And the, the image shows chaos. It's dark because uh, they were massacred on a, um, in the evening. 
they, they committed suicide rather than be massacred in the evening. And then they uh, set a fire to the tower so their bodies would be burned in the fire. And this way, uh, the Christians wouldn't be able to mutilate their bodies after their death. In 1389, during a terrible pogrom in Prague, which wiped out almost the entire Jewish community, Jews fled here to the Alt Shul, hoping to be saved. But the mob followed them into the synagogue and massacred women, children, and men here in this space. Their blood remained on the walls for centuries. And there's a legend that says, whenever there's Jewish suffering in the world, the walls of the synagogue turn red. Několik set let vlastně tam tedy ta připomínka toho pogromu měla být a samozřejmě v literatuře ji připomíná slycha žalospěv rabína a Viktora Káry. In Christian and Muslim countries, it was common that there were laws that synagogues could not be taller than churches or mosques. So this painting represents the tin church in the old town square in Prague, casting its shadow over the old new synagogue. And the Hebrew is, how long shall my enemies have domination over us? And the idea here is that the Hebrew clock from the Jewish town hall in Prague is counting the time that the domination would end, whereas the Christian clock with the Roman numerals has no hands on it, that the domination will never end. <laughs> Židovská kultura ve Španělsku byla výrazná, dala světu četné židovské myslitele. Byla zajímavá i tím, že trvala dlouhá staletí a židé nikdy samozřejmě na území Španělska netvořili většinu. Takže přesto, že se jednalo o menšinu, tak ta menšina nebo že jí bylo umožněno žít v poměrně dobrých vztazích, ať tedy s muslimy nebo s křesťany, ale to se potom s nástupem toho Ferdinanda a jeho manželky Izabely změnilo. Židé byli vypovězeni ze Španělska, následně teda i z Portugalska, vlastně z Pirenejského poloostrova a znamenalo to zánik jedné velké kultury, což už si možná dnes zcela neuvědomujeme, ale tak tomu skutečně bylo a proto to téma, i pokud tak jako Mark Podval stvárně, proto to téma dostalo zvláštní, zvláštní význam. In 1492, over 200,000 Jews were expelled from Spain. There were Jews who felt that exile was not so awful because the comparison was with massacres and Jews not being able to leave with their lives. Ironically, throughout the 19th century, many synagogues, such as the Spanish synagogue in Prague and this Eldred Street synagogue, were built with Moorish designs. Was it an unconscious longing for the golden age in Spain before the Jews were exiled? This painting represents the exile, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. And here's a, uh, a Spanish galleon. And what's dominant in the picture is the Torah, the laws of the Jews. And the Hebrew verse from the book of Psalms says, your laws are songs to me no matter where I go.
1215, under the instigation of Pope Innocent III, the Lateran Council mandated that Jews had to be distinguished from Christians by their dress. The first way of distinguishing Jews was that Jewish men had to wear a, a special hat. Often it was yellow. Yellow was a symbol for cowardice. And later, there would be other forms of distinguishing marks. For example, a yellow circle worn over the left side of the chest. In 1516, the Jews of Venice were forced to live in one part of the city. That part of the city was known as the ghetto. Subsequently, when Jews in other cities were forced to live in one section of the city, those sections also were called ghettos. In the fifth century, Augustine wrote that the Jews shouldn't be killed. They should be kept among the people as constant reminders that they were the killers of Christ. It was taught by the church that not only was every Jew in the generation when Christ lived responsible for his death, but every generation after of Jews was responsible for the death of Jesus. And so passion plays were performed in front of churches throughout Europe. And this represents a stage with uh, Jesus and Pontius Pilate and the high priest Caiaphas. This represents the breastplate of the high priest with the 12 stones symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the passion plays emphasize the role of the Jews as being guilty in the crucifixion of Jesus. And at times after the play ended, the mobs would be so infuriated they would go and attack the local Jewish community. This picture represents from 1880 to 1884 the pogroms in southern Russia, which caused many Jews to leave Russia and come to the United States. Lidé, zvlášť třeba v Evropě, ve Spojených státech, často zapomínají. Prostě pro ně je ten život zcela poklidný, vlastně nic se, nic se neděje, není se čeho bát, když to ta židovská zkušenost a na tu Mark podval, a je to zajímavé, je to američan, ale na něj on takto upozorně říká, že vlastně nikdy, já to takhle aspoň po textu cítím, nikdy člověk neví, co bude zítra. Je to v tom jeho cyklu, čtou zcela jistě Židé, ale myslím si, že to je dobře vysledovatelné i pro všechny vnímavé recipienty jeho umění. The Wandering Jew is a medieval legend. It's a purely anti-Semitic myth. By the 18th century, the Wandering Jew became identified with the fate of the Jewish people as a whole. This magnificent synagogue, the Eldred Street Synagogue, first opened its doors in 1887. It was the first time in America that Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia built their own synagogue from the ground up. Between 1880 and 1924, two and a half million Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia came to the United States. Immigrants gathered here to pray and to build their own community. Here in America, Jews could worship openly and freely. And so this synagogue stands as a testament to religious freedom. In America, the wandering Jew could end his wandering. Yet during World War II, due to strict immigration quotas, many Jews were denied entrance, those who were trying to flee German persecution in Europe. <laughs> Mezi náměty, které se objeví v tom cyklu, je uh, také ničení uh, různých synagog, což byl i historicky zřejmě takový 
nejviditelnější projev násilí vůči, vůči židům. Prostě jejich svatyně je zničena, jejich svatyně hoří. K tomu se samozřejmě nelze vyhnout. Nakonec bylo to aktualizováno i v moderních dějinách během té tzv. křišťálové noci, kdy na území Sudet hořely synagogy. A já bych to viděl prostě jako jeden z motivů, protože i to téma se rozpadá do řady dílčích událostí. Tento motiv je zcela jistě silný a je pochopitelné tedy, že v tom cyklu má svou odezvu. On november 8. 9. 1938, the Nazis organized state sanctioned riots against the Jewish populations. Thousands of Jewish businesses were were destroyed, synagogues were burned to the ground. That night has come to be known as Kristallnacht because of all the glass that was shattered in the streets. Although six-pointed stars are common on tombstones nowadays, in this cemetery, six-pointed stars are rare. It was only in Prague that the six-pointed star became a Jewish symbol. And whereas Jews had to distinguish themselves by wearing yellow circles in the Middle Ages, the Germans forced the Jews during World War II to wear yellow six-pointed stars. <laughs> Perhaps the most challenging and difficult artwork for me to create for this series was the artwork specific on the subject of Terezin. There are thousands of drawings and paintings created by talented artists who were prisoners here, how could I create something with any power or emotion when I was never here, when I was born after the war? Symbolizing the Terezin concentration camp, the lower part is based upon a drawing by a prisoner, and then the butterfly represents the poem, perhaps the most famous of the children's poems from Terezin, I never saw another butterfly which ends with that butterflies don't live in the ghetto. And here there's a uh, pencil drawing a butterfly representing the thousands of children's drawings from Terezin that have still been preserved. The name Terezin remains in history, absolutely. And therefore, uh, Mark has a very special attitude towards history. It, it gives it an artistic dimension to it. And, and uh, it's important. It's important because it becomes a way of sharing, of sharing what we have, what we receive, and that is art. When I see the sad, cramped conditions that people were forced to live in, the first thing that comes to mind is trying to imagine how I would have been in this situation. But in reality, there is no way that anybody could imagine how awful it was. Only those who were here and experienced the situation. The great artist Picasso once said that at age 16, he was able to draw like Rembrandt, but it took him his whole life to be able to draw like a child. Children's drawings are uncensored. Their innocence expresses the truth that they see around them. And among the most sad documents left from Terezin are the drawings of the children who almost all would die at Auschwitz. And this represents the concentration camps that some of them had the words at the entrance, Arbeit macht frei, work sets you free. Here's the, all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Most of them are upside down. The inverted menorah represents the railroad tracks coming from many, many places, all leading to one place, a concentration camp.
Although I was very familiar with the landscape of Auschwitz from photographs and from my interest in Holocaust studies, what struck me when I was here with Elie Wiesel first in 1994 was that I was able to see where the camp ended. In my imagination, the camp went on forever. It's a uh, an apotheosis. It was worse than at any other time. Is it a unique experience? It becomes unique because it happened like that. But uh, we have accepted there were other persecutions before. But this one is unparalleled. Here in Auschwitz, these are the ruins of one of the gas chambers and crematorium where the Jews were uh, murdered. In the Middle Ages, Jews were murdered because they were considered the killers of Christ. They were murdered by populations that wanted to erase the debts that they owed to the Jews. Jews were murdered from the false accusation that they had poisoned the wells that caused the Black Death. But there were times when Jews could escape death by converting to Christianity, and on occasion some Jews did. In the Nazi era, Jews did not have the choice of converting to escape death. Jews were, were murdered because they were Jews, not, not because they were necessarily accused of killing Christ. It became a racial hatred where the, where the Germans dehumanized the Jews and considered them vermin. And so they, they poisoned Jews with the pesticide Zyklone B, which was used to kill lice. This is the site of the family camp where September 8, 1943, 5,000 Jews were taken from Theresienstadt and brought here. The families remained together. The women didn't have their hair cut off. The children were able to play during the days. It was a very unusual situation for Auschwitz. Then six months after the Jews were brought here, they, all those Jews who had survived those six months were murdered in one night. It was the largest massacre of Czechoslovak citizens during World War II. And for the liquidation of the Czech family camp, which took place March in 1944, on the night of Purim, the Jewish festival of Purim, there's a Megillah scroll that's opened to the outlawed Czech flag. There's the entrance to Birkenau, the picture of the crematorium, and the, the um, cookies, the humantaschen that are eaten on Purim form a six-pointed star, and the colors are the colors of the Czech flag, red, white, and blue. This work illustrates Psalm 103, verse 15, which says that man's days are like those of grass. He blooms like a flower of the field. A wind passes by, and it is no more. So this work is about the mortality of man. The final image has the menorah that's being carried away by the Germans in the first picture. It's the seven fruits of the Bible sprouting from the seven branches of the menorah. This is the menorah on the uh, symbol of Israel. And then the Israeli flag has the psalm, those who plant with tears will harvest in joy. And this psalm, Psalm 126, almost was the national anthem of Israel instead of Hatikvah. So it's a very appropriate way to end a series on Jewish suffering with the optimism of the establishment of the State of Israel. This is the Jewish cemetery in Terezin. Artists continually try to cheat death, for they hope their work will live after them. And this happened here in Terezin with the artists who were imprisoned in Terezin. Their art survives them.